All right. So we've made it now to the very last topic in this chapter on sequences and series, which is Taylor series. So Taylor series is all about finding power series representations for functions. And now we know that already that a power series is a function, right? We know it makes sense to do something like f of x is equal to the sum n going from 0 to infinity a n x to the n, right? Um, we've seen how to calculate radius and interval of convergence, so we know about the domain for a power series function. We know how to integrate, right? One of the things that's great about these is in integrating, differentiating is really easy. We just do it term by term using the power rule. We love power rule, right? Power rule is easy. Um, and that's one of the things that makes power series so useful, is that they are so easy to work with, right? In terms of taking derivatives and integrals. Um, yes, you've got to use summation notation. Yes, you've got to be comfortable with things like shifting indices around and, you know, you know shifting from n equals 0 to n equals 1, things like that. Um, but these are things that are, you know, they're pretty easy skills to learn. They are not fundamental obstructions like having a, a differential equation or an integral that you simply cannot evaluate in terms of elementary functions, right? Um, so a power series can, can sort of fit into a lot of scenarios where functions that we, we're familiar with just don't work. They can't get the job done. Power series might still get the job done, right? Um, but we'd still like to tie things into a series that we're familiar with. And we saw, we saw an example, right? We ended the last section with this example. We said, okay, if you have f of x equal to the sum and equal to 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, right? We played around with that and we said, oh, it's equal to its own derivative. It's equal to its own antiderivative. Um, this function is exactly the natural exponential. Pretty cool, right? Um, some books might even go as far as defining the natural exponential this way in terms of a power series, right? Um, often when you're studying uh, functions of a complex variable, you define functions in terms of power series. Um, power series are really useful in complex variables. Um, and um, I, I would encourage anyone, you know, once you've done this course, if you have the opportunity, take a course in complex variables. Um, Things that are kind of mysterious when you're looking at sequences in series, you know, functions of a real variable, like why do we call it radius of convergence, right? It's an interval. Why do we say radius? Um, do things in complex numbers and you'll understand, right? Um, power series actually make way more sense in complex numbers than they do in real numbers. So take a course in complex variables if you get the chance. Um, it's a lot of fun. So we can do that. Um, actually, we see another one. Uh, we, saw, we saw this one. We said the sum n going from uh, 0, from 0 to infinity of x to the n. We said, oh, that's, that's a geometric series, right? We can do that's 1, 1 over 1 minus x, right? Um, or if we had, similarly, if we had h of x equal to the sum n going from 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n, x to the n, we might say, oh, well, look, this is just minus x to the n. That's still a geometric series. Um, replace x by minus x. Oh, but 1 minus minus x, that's 1 plus x. All right? Still, the interval of convergence is open interval from minus 1 to 1. Um, but then there's, there's some games you can play with this. One of the things you can do is say, hey, what if I... What if I take the antiderivative of this, right? Um, so if I did the antiderivative of h of x dx, right? Um, and by the way, this equality isn't valid everywhere. This function is defined, you know, everywhere except for x equal to minus 1. Similarly here, this is defined everywhere except for x equal to plus 1. Um, but this has domain simply minus 1 to 1, right? It's got a much smaller domain than the corresponding function over here. But we can play around with this. We can do things like, oh, you know, if I integrate this, um, well, that's like integrating 1 over 1 plus x. Um, oh, you know, that's the natural log, right? It's the natural log of 1 plus x. And then suddenly now you've got a power series representation for natural logs, okay? So you can play these sorts of games. 
But this is not the only way to sort of access this sort of power series representation for functions. The other way to come about it is to take, you know, come at this from the angle of Taylor polynomials, right? So uh, those of you taking calculus with me at the University of Lethbridge, uh, you did Taylor polynomials way back in Calc 1. That's where we put it in our curriculum. Others, you might have just seen the videos on Taylor polynomials between power series and Taylor series, depending on where you've seen it. But one of the things that we, we see when we study Taylor series is somebody gives you a, a function f, they give you a degree n, they give you a center c, right? You can define the Taylor polynomial of degree n with, you know, for the function f centered at c. You can put all that in if you want. And we said, oh, so this is by definition, right? It's, it's f of c plus f prime of c times x minus c. There's your linear approximation, right? And then you do your quadratic approximation and so on up to whatever your top degree is. nth derivative at c, n factorial, x minus c to the n. Um, but you know, this, this starts to be a bit of a mouthful, so why not put it into summation notation? Right? n equals, well, maybe we shouldn't do n there, k. k goes from 0 to n, kth derivative at c, divide by k factorial, x minus c to the k, right? And that looks a little bit like a power series, except we stop, right? It's a polynomial, right? But we've got a power of x, we've got a coefficient, starting to look more like a power series. And when you study Taylor polynomials, one of the things that, that comes up is the fact that typically as you increase the degree as n goes up, approximation gets better, right? The point of a Taylor polynomial is that this is, this is sort of a, you know, in a sense, depending on how you define best, maybe it's not the best, but it's a very good um, polynomial approximation um, to the function f near the point c, right? And the larger the degree gets, the further away from C you can go while still having a good approximation, right? Um, and the approximation improves um, basically as this gets smaller or as this gets bigger. Those are the two ways to improve your approximation. Right? Um, and the other thing that we see when we study Taylor polynomials is we have this idea of a remainder, right? So f of x, right? Well, it's not equal to its polynomial, its Taylor polynomial, because the Taylor polynomial is only an approximation. But we can get equality if we tack on this remainder term, right? Remainder for the degree n polynomial for the function f at c. And remember that you know, there, there are actually a number of different formulas for this remainder, but one of the formulas for the remainder is that it's the next derivative, right, the n plus first derivative of f at some value t, n plus 1 factorial, and then x minus c to the n plus 1, right, um, for some number t. And all you can really say about that number t is that it's somewhere between, um, basically it's, it's going to be somewhere between, you know, um, I guess C, or oh, X minus C, you know, wherever X and C are. It's between X and C. Depends on whether X is bigger or smaller than C, right? Um, so it depends on, it depends on X. Um, this number T is always between X and C. We can't say what it is because the way you derive this formula is basically with like a mean value theorem type argument. Um, but the presence of that factorial there suggests that, well, you know, as long as these derivatives are not growing too big too fast, as long as there's not a corresponding increase in the size of those derivatives, and sometimes there is because, of course, 
you know, that factorial is, is there to balance the fact that when you take the derivative of a power function, right, if you take repeated derivatives, you essentially do get that factorial in there. Uh, but this remainder should get smaller as n gets bigger for most functions, for reasonably well-behaved functions, right? And so then the idea is you might say, well, hey, maybe if I let n go to infinity, that remainder goes to zero, and, and then this actually becomes equality. I just have to let n go to infinity here, and then I will actually have f f of x equal to a power series where the terms in the power series are computed using Taylor's formula. Um, and that's exactly what you get. That is a Taylor series, right? So a Taylor series is basically what you get if you take a Taylor polynomial and you let n go to infinity. And what we want to study are the conditions under which that Taylor series is exactly equal to the function you started with.